I'm Jillian Finley. The Fifth Estate starts now. Only one has to sing this, yeah. Only one, one, only. Yeah. Look. Sit down, sit down. down. Nobody move. Hey, guys. Hey. Sit down. I'm going to give everyone a life jacket. Yes, sir. They put on the life jacket properly. Yes, sir. All right? Yes, sir. And nobody moves. Yes, sir. We're here to preserve life, and that's really it. I don't think anyone thinks that this is the solution. It, it, it can't be. Hey, don't fight, don't fight! Hey, don't fight, don't fight! How many persons? 20. 22, okay. So look, what's going to happen? Yeah. They're going to throw a rope in the front. Yes, sir. And a rope in the back. Yes. You need to tie on the front back. Yes. And somebody tie in the front. Yes, sir. Only one person. No problem. Not everyone. Yes, sir. One person tied back okay. and come in the front. You have the fear when, when you're traveling because in the sea you don't, you don't know where you're going, you don't know if you're getting there safely. Anything can happen on the way. That is just your last hope. It's just a few days into the fall. And on the Mediterranean, that's a time of unpredictability. Ahead, on the world's busiest asylum passage at sea, both the weather and the numbers can swing. The Fifth Estate gets exclusive access to the rescue ship responder on its mission to prevent tragedy at sea. A team of 25, there's the crew, Red Cross workers, and highly skilled rescuers from the Migrant Offshore Aid Station, or MOAS, a privately funded NGO. This vessel alone has saved 16,000 since June, and they know there will be more. The sea separates Europe from a staggering crisis usually measured in the tens of millions. An unprecedented exodus fueled by war-torn Syria, authoritarian Eritrea, and by poverty and violence. Their pursuit of safe haven across borders and desert makes them easy prey to human smugglers, even organ traffickers, all before they arrive in lawless Libya, now the preferred transit station to Europe. Until something concrete is put into place that can stop people dying on the scale that they're dying at the moment without us being here, just keep on doing it, we have to. This year, the sea has claimed a record more than 3,800 dead and they know they're preventable. So the responder leaves Malta to do its part, carrying three weeks' supply and one guiding principle that no one deserves to die at sea. We are about 18 nautical miles off the Libyan coast, and the responder is now in position. Okay, so this is the main deck of uh, Topless Responder. Uh, so we have two FRDCs, which are fast rescue craft. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, Alan and Galib, uh, named after the two boys uh, in Turkey, Alan, uh, Alan Kurdi and his brother Galib, uh, who wasn't uh, as well known, but uh, also passed away on that day. Nick Romaniak took a huge pay cut to work as a rescuer on board. And six months in, he now carries memories crowded with epic encounters, a blur of harrowing stories. As rescuer, it's the responsibility that weighs on him most. You'll, you'll have a knot in your stomach and um, you can be looking at a, at a boat. We did one a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago, people holding tiny babies up. There's not a lot of room for, for error, really. I will show you the, our infirmary. Okay. That's the entrance. Mm -hmm. Our doc is already here. Hi. Carrie Janschke's call belies what trauma or fatigue might be just under the surface. Before this, she did four months in war-torn South Sudan. And now this assignment is going into overtime. I just 
feel like we have a huge big privilege back home as Europeans and I just want to share something about it. It's nice to talk to the people about their history, what they have been through. It sometimes breaks my heart as well. This is to uh, keep your body warm okay. when you're in the water. I also arrived in Italy like a migrant. I was like 15, 16 years old when I got here. With a gift for languages, Nabi Osman is at ease with most asylum seekers. And as a former asylum seeker himself, only he brings first-hand understanding of choosing a last resort. It's his first mission at sea, and it's profoundly personal. I'm trying to help many people, I'm trying to help the people I can help. Most of them when seeing me speaking the same language with them, or being and listen and African like them. So this is like the, the kind of the brains of the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where we have uh, Danny on watch. Hello, Hello there. Hi. Um, so we all have always have uh, two people on watch up here. So how small a boat can you pick up on that thing? Uh, if it was flat conditions, we can pick up a small rubber boat or a small wooden boat. I definitely still feel like uh, that's unfair, for sure. Because uh, it goes wrong, uh, a lot of people die. With the weather turning, there's no sign of life. When it gets like this, um, the radars actually pick up the swell, so we won't necessarily pick up a, a, a rubber boat, but hopefully they're not out in this. The area they patrol is just outside Libya's territorial waters. It would actually be Libya's responsibility, were it not embroiled in chaos and violence, allowing smugglers to flourish. All that makes Libya's coast the ideal gateway to Europe. So it's only foreign vessels, including the responder, that keep watch day after day. But the sea can rage for days at a time now, and even a rescue ship has few defenses against this. Still, every day at 5 a.m. they start hourly shifts, on the lookout for the otherwise doomed death traps leaving Libya's shores. They also know there's a growing backlog of people watching the swell from the coast, so the responder will wait. Early on day eight, when the waves finally give way to calm, the boats begin to drift into view. The first is a wooden boat, 31 on board, and with limited fuel and sustenance, zero chance of surviving long. Then it's everyone to their stations, wearing suits that protect against contagious disease. One by one, I will tell you when to start. No, I will tell you when to start. Hey, hey, down. You guys sit down. Sit down. Nick tries to take control. Don't move, guys. Come on, my friend, come on. Dressed to jump in if he has to. Come on. Come on. Hey, sit down. It is deadly if the boat tips. Most don't know how to swim. Arms up. What's this? What's this? Show me. Everything is taken away for a search, though most come with almost nothing. Can I see your hands, please? Carrie is checking for signs of fever, scabies, and dehydration. And your towel. Uh, okay, so I checked the dehydration. A case of bronchitis aside, most are in good shape. <coughs> so all three boats together thank leave you, beach. Okay, thank you. The crew has just learned. In all, there had been three boats launched from the same spot just over an hour outside Libya's capital. It's a matter of particular concern for Loki Ugoji. He was just rescued from the first of those boats, but the ordeal for him is far from over, and he asks Nabi for help. My wife is inside on the first boat. I don't know if it's here. How, how, how many are there? 
Yeah. How many votes are left? There are three. Three? Okay. Your wife is inside one? Yeah. With your child or just without child? No, without child. Okay, now we have not seen them. Yeah. Sit down, sit down. We have not seen them yet, but if we see them, we'll, we'll try and get them. You understand? I will try and talk to the people and see maybe if they see something around. But if there is any information, I will let you know. Okay? They will, they will be separated, so I don't know, maybe there's some rescue ship around. Does that happen often? The families are separated like that? Yeah, yeah. We have a lot. She's on the boat. And why not together? Why not together? They, they, they separated us, you understand? So they first left before us. So that's why I'm asking that man. If anybody has come here, he said no. Lockie describes a terrible journey, driven out by a violent episode in East Nigeria that claimed the lives of family, but also by an even more urgent need for medical attention. I decided to make a move so that the Italians would take care of me. I'm not feeling fine. We checked the blood group. The blood group is SS, sickle cell and pneumonia. I do have crisis. So that's why I just find myself here for them to help me out on treatment. After five months of captivity and beatings by smugglers, Lockie can safely surrender to exhaustion, but unsure if he will see his wife again. Rescued so far, 31, but this is only the beginning. On their eighth day at sea, the crew of the rescue ship Responder have been helping a steady stream of asylum seekers in distress on the Mediterranean. But as you'll see, the pace is going to pick up significantly. It isn't yet 10 a.m. when they find the biggest rubber dinghy they've ever seen. A record 170 people crammed on board, floating in the heat for eight hours. With this many people, it can be a death trap. This time, there are women on board, 39 of them, most from Nigeria. And two of them are pregnant. And turn around, turn around, turn around. The women are evacuated to the responder first. Just, just see the problem. Just see, okay? Just from now. Just happen now. Rest of you stay seated. Hey, you guys sit down. Pass the line to the back. Rescuer Nick Romaniak has seen this go wrong before. Hey, sit down, guys. Sit down. If they panic, people will get crushed. The dinghy has to stay balanced. Those containers of fuel upright and everyone calm. You guys, sit down, sit. If they'd been in a boat for another six hours, if they'd slipped by, uh, you know, dehydration would start kicking in. Uh, the heat, the sun, uh, and then you start getting fatalities uh, pretty quickly. It takes time, but they all get on board. Safe for now. Oh, oh hi, welcome. <laughs> Okay. Carrie, the Red Cross nurse, tries to lighten the mood. She can easily spot the effects of the trauma from captivity, abuse, and rape. Yeah, you see a lot in people's eyes. They've been treated very badly sometimes. And of course, they anyway feel weak because of the travel, of their, what they have been through. Just seven hours since the first rescue, the responder now has 224 asylum seekers on board. None of it is any comfort for Loki Ugoji, the welder from Nigeria, separated from his wife this morning. He doesn't know if she's still alive. All of you are Nigerians? Yes. Okay. From where are you, Mr. 
Sudanese? Yeah, we have nine men, one from Senegal, Syria, Tunis, and Morocco. Ahmed has had little reason for hope since he fled the war in Syria. He says this voyage was his final hope, that there are no other ways out for Syrians. Nick knows more will be coming. That there are the unscrupulous willing to profit from such desperation. Operating beyond the reach of any law. So in a stab at even a hint of justice, he destroys the rubber boats so they can never be used again. Set adrift with the remnants of lives willfully left behind. We got a soak uh, in the foot. Now I gave it some uh, anesthesia, local anesthesia, and I'll explore it and uh, probably I will stitch it up. We are actually an ambulance here and we are limited with our resources. Is she still conscious? Yeah, she's conscious. Good. So if someone is uh, complaining of headache, yes, we do have painkiller. We can do a dressing, but we can't treat chronic disease. Other organizations are now helping handle what's turning into a relentless influx. One rescue group transferred to the responder, mostly Libyans. As their conflict deepens, more are taking the exits available on their shores. Mid-afternoon, and the deck is filling up. 250 people are now on board. Nabi Nabi, we have 10 men on board. One, two from Libya, one Gambia. Bangladesh? And one from Egypt. Willful defectors, forever bound by one desperate passage, expecting the worst, some wore their emergency contacts. The deck of the responder, now a human map of world misery, that also includes Eritrea, one of the top sources of the world's refugees. The most harrowing part of Fakhreddin Saik's odyssey came long before Libya. Four prison stints under the Eritrean regime, then traffickers and dead bodies to dodge in the Sahara. From Eritrea, uh, from Karan, up to uh, the town of Kasala, I'm going about uh, nine days by, by my walk, by feet, only. no by car. Nine days, very, very, very dangerous in the mountains, the forest, and also uh, high now, uh, flutes. Lighters and cigarettes, very, fire is very dangerous on ship. We've saved you, we don't want to now, we don't want to go up in flames. Madam, if you move my own self, I'm full of sweat. If I, if I, if I come out the tip, put inside this river, all the fish will die. So I just relax and just talk to them with they smile in the face and just trying to tell them to relax themselves so they don't have any problems. So I just try to keep things under control. Even Navy ships pitch in on days like this. The British HMS Enterprise picked up two boats, saving 49 people. They're transferred over so the ship can remain on patrol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've tried. Victorious. <laughs> the officer's best. <laughs> On one boat was just one woman. The cruelty of the smugglers to put her in such a vulnerable position. 
Right over here, please. Okay. Everyone is seated in the order they arrive. As the only woman on her boat, she gets her own lonely spot. Her arrival, the closest thing we witness to a miracle at sea. She is Aisha, remember, forcibly separated from her husband, Loki, implausibly within sight of each other again. They're still separated until the ongoing rescue on board is finished. Madam, from where are you? Nigeria. Nigeria. Is she the one you're looking for? Okay. I'm so shocked. I, I didn't believe that I would still be alive up to now. I just thank God. Thank you. You said you're shocked you're alive. Why are you shocked? Because where the, the engine fell inside and the boat tried to turn upside down. But God did something. How many people? Yeah, 27 in number. Are you the only woman? Yes. That's my, like, my friend here, yeah, I'm telling you. He has been searching on the ship, calling, calling, calling. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. So, 40 women? Yep. The woman in there is pregnant, right? Yeah. Yep. How's she doing? Almost all of the women soon fall asleep. It's probably the safest they've been in months. But just one, one bottle, okay? And pass it on, pass it on. By the end of the day, the responder is nearly full. 324 rescued. Among them hairstylists, a factory worker, even a florist, and a couple now reunited. Almost certainly, there are others whose boats were not found, and they are almost certainly dead. The responder is instructed to make its way north to the Sicilian port of Pozzalo. They're on their way to Europe, but does Europe want them? It's day nine. The asylum seekers wake up at sea to a day they've only imagined. Moods lifted. In the safety of the responders' main deck, they can fold away some concerns to start contemplating others. 324 people and their dreams en route to the Sicilian port of Pozzalo. So get there, okay? Italy is very cool. So please, nobody rest here. Everybody is going. So have patience, sit down, relax. So please, understand yourself, okay? Thank you. For each one, Europe means something different. Jobs, safety, sometimes family. Or a haven from conflict and tyranny, the way Eritrean Fahreddin Sheikh sees it. So I'm very, very happy now to be like this, to be now born like uh, another. For Syrians fleeing the civil war, like Ahmed, this is the long way to Europe, but one of the shortest routes to normality. The responder reaches the tip of Italy, and soon they'll take their first steps in Europe. How will they be received on a continent growing weary of the constant arrivals on its shores? After an initial welcome last year to the tens of thousands desperate for asylum, came aversion, and in some countries, outright hostility. 
The issue has dominated elections, invigorated nationalist movements, and threatens governments. None of it seems to have had any bearing on the flow. More than 153,000 stepped foot in Italy this year. Saved at sea, they believe they have a shot at life in a new land. But many of them will be rejected. So just because they get here doesn't mean a happy ending. Loki Egoji, remember reunited with his wife Aisha, must now persuade authorities he needs to stay for urgent medical care. I can't find you out there. I mean, so I was just committing suicide because the country I'm coming from, no help. Okay, good luck. Good luck to you guys. Good luck to you guys. I try to inform them about that, that the European system is not easy. So the first one, two, three years is going to be difficult for you. So don't think going get into Europe, this is gonna just get easy for you like that. It will be an uneasy relationship and ongoing, perhaps for generations, even if the arrivals stop tomorrow. I would actually just like to ask the people at home how would they react if they are suffering back home? suffering because there is no money, suffering because they are they don't have something to eat, suffering because there's a war ongoing since years and they have a family. I question myself sometimes, how would people back home react if they just want to save their family's life? On this side of an unpredictable sea, for the moment they are treated with dignity, made to feel welcome. But is it, as critics believe, partly the rescue ships that draw them? I don't think that we're, we're encouraging people to make the trip. The, I think if there was a little bit more information for these people so that they knew that this trip to a certain extent would be in vain, maybe they wouldn't come. It's, it's a crazy uh, voyage, I mean, with a very strong chance of dying. Um, they get to Europe and then their claim is rejected and they're sent back to the country of origin. Um, it seems like a, a huge waste, but... Um, seems, sounds like the definition of hell. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Yeah, well, all purgatory, anyway. Mm -hmm.